Hey everyone, it's me, Whimsy, hey. and I've got, uh, hello. <laughs> I have a really amazing person here, uh, my friend Chuck and amazing artist and trance medium. Uh, Chuck Dransfield is here again to answer our questions about what it is like to be in the heart and soul of another person as an artist. But sp specifically, mm -hmm. you've, you've done a lot of work uh, for people who don't know. Uh, Chuck is a professional artist. You live in Hollywood. Los yes, Los I do. Angeles. Yes. And you've been painting celebrities for quite a while now, haven't you? Uh, probably since I was a child. Uh, as in fact, uh, the very first drawing I ever did in my life, my first portrait was Lucille Ball when I was three years old. This oh, wow. stick figure with orange curly hair with the crayon. My sister had that drawing for many years and now she can't find it. I keep telling her, please locate it because I would love to frame that and put it up oh, with all my wonderful. art. That's probably the earliest record of me doing a celebrity portrait. Mm -hmm. Now today, because you, you know, I hope you'll keep coming back, but today I just was so curious uh, if you could talk a little bit about developing the, the relation. You have a very special relationship with all of the people you paint. You connect with them in really deep ways. Can you talk about your relationship at all with uh, Lucille Ball? Why as a really young child do you think you were attracted oh. to that particular actor? That's one of the people, uh, I can't remember a time in my life where I wasn't attracted to her. Uh, my sister said, my big sister, she's 14 years older than I am. She mm -hmm. said when I was a little boy, like two, three years old, I used to go up to the television set when Lucy would be on. And I would just almost want to hug the TV, the TV screen. And I, I know for myself, Lucy was like a mother figure to me. Mm -hmm. you know, my own relationship with my birth mother was a rather complicated. I won't go into it here. It's forgiven, but nonetheless, it was a complex relationship. I wasn't really getting the nurturement I needed from her. And Lucy was bigger than life. And I, I guess it, she just made me happy. She made me feel good. I felt so safe and protected when I was in Lucy's presence. So it started at a very early age where she became like a mother figure to me. You know, I mean, I mean, I say that with the awareness, you know, she was on a television screen, you know, I don't, but that's how it felt to me as a child. And I think that got rooted deeply into me early on. Wow. And so you probably spent a lot of time uh, watching her career over the years. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I became a big I Love Lucy fan early on. I'd watch the Lucy show. I grew up in the early 60s. So it was the Lucy show at night and it was I Love Lucy on during the daytime. So that was my double dose. I just knew I loved her. and She, she made me laugh so hard. She made me feel so good. Um, so, yes, lifelong fan. I even got to see her work once. I never got to meet Lucy. But in 1986, she attempted a revival of her sitcom. It didn't do well. It only lasted about eight episodes, unfortunately. But I got to sit in the audience. So I got to sit in the audience and watch the great Lucille Ball work in front of the cameras. And I consider that a milestone in my life. I could not have been more thrilled. It couldn't have meant more to me. Wow. Have that. Now, do you remember where, where you were when you heard that she had passed over, that she had passed on? Yes, I do, as a matter of fact. Well, I knew that she had been ill. You know, she had been in Cedar sinai for the week. She had a, uh, I believe, a partial heart transplant. Oh, wow. But, yeah, it was very serious. But her aorta ruptured uh, very early in the morning, like five in the morning. And I was at work in Beverly Hills at the time. And it was maybe 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Someone came in and said, did you hear that Lucy died? And I was like, no, because I, we were all holding out that she was going to recover. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she, you know, that everything looked good until that morning when her aorta ruptured, it was just her time to go. And I, I, I people took it like a death in the family. I saw people all around Beverly Hills, walking on the sidewalks, looking sad, forlorn. And, oh. and then later that day, I talked to other people. I had people calling me because they knew what she meant to me. I actually had friends from 
the East Coast and all around LA calling me, are you okay? Are you okay? Like I had lost a family member. And that's what it did feel like. It was like losing a family member. I was, I was very sad. But I guess this, this cuts into what we were going to talk about, about her spirit yes. being with me. If, now, was, can I, I, can I just, before we get oh, started, of course. that's, uh, for a lot of people don't know that you are actually a medium, that you are a trance medium, and that you communicate with people who have passed on. And so I guess I, that's what I want to ask about is when did she oh. actually start communicating with you? Did you well, that's, out? What happened when you actually made It was up? very quick. Oh, it was okay. very quick. See, in those days, well, she died in 1989. In those days, I didn't think of myself as being a trans medium. I just knew that I would pick up on things. I was sensitive. Uh, I said this in the last interview. Uh, it's like when you know, a per you have your back turned and you know a person is in the room. You know their energy. I, I can't tangibly explain it, except three days after her death, I knew she was with me. I just knew it. I, my cat's getting in the frame here. I just knew she was in the room and I could feel her energy. It was very comforting. And it was like, I'm okay. It's okay. Don't be sad. It's okay. I just transitioned. It's all right. But she came to me so fast. And I couldn't even understand it. I thought, well, maybe this is just my imagination, but it just felt so solid and real. And then she came to me in a dream that night and just started chatting with me. I don't remember the specifics of the conversation other than it was engaging and warm and friendly and loving. And then I started having dreams almost every night for a while where she would come to me and again, just chat with me. And uh, like, she wanted to get to know me better. And she more or less implied, like she had known me like in, in, a, in past lives, we had known each other already. Oh, so wow. she knew where to find me. And uh, she just sought me out. I, maybe she was magnetized to the energy because I was in so much grief and I was thinking about her so much and other people who do this will say that when you're in that state, it's like making a phone call, like you're, you're dialing out to the universe and spirits will pick up on that. Whatever it was, she was magnetized and came to me within three days. Um, it became more involved as time went on because, you know, this was over 30 years ago. Right. Uh, I don't want to. I don't know if you have other questions. I don't know if I should go on to some other things. Oh, well, I, yeah, like how did your, because it, I mean, the, the wild thing about your relationship with Lucille Ball is that it, you actually begin your relationship with her after she passes on. That is interesting. Yeah. And I'll tell you another thing that's interesting. After she passed away, then I started meeting a lot of her friends, a lot of her coworkers. Uh, I met her son, I met her daughter, met her uh, her husband. Uh, it was like everybody started coming out of the woodworks. Wow. It's, it wasn't when she was alive. It was after she died. So I don't know if it was Lucy guiding people to me, coincidental, but I suddenly started to meet people who were on I Love Lucy. I met uh, people who worked for her when she was their boss, relatives, close friends, where I she just felt like part of my family. So it's kind of like she brought you into her inner circle afterwards, like, you know what, Chuck, you're I think maybe so. You and said, you know, I'm going to connect you with my friends. It almost sounds like yeah. that. Well, one of the people I was connected with was a man named Bart Andrews. He uh, wrote uh, the I Love Lucy book. That's what it's called, the I Love Lucy book. And it was a big bestseller. I think it had something like 26 printings, just an iconic book that was a, like a perennial in the bookstores. Well, it was around 1991, I met him and we became very close, very close. And he introduced me to a lot of the I Love Lucy people as well. But years, I'm jumping ahead here, but years later, he and I collaborated on a book about I Love Lucy and Lucy Ball. It never got published because of a lot of politics for a variety of reasons. It didn't get published, but I did have the experience of intimately researching Lucille Ball's life where I used to joke that I was eating, sleeping and breathing 
I Love Lucy. I was getting my doctorate in Tessie Lou. Oh. And there was this one night I was writing about her step grandmother when she was a little girl. Uh, it, the story was that her mother had to leave her with the step grandmother for a while while she went off to work in another city. And I had read these biographical accounts of how strict the grandmother was. It was almost like something out of a Dickens novel. Like she would make Lucy wash dishes over and over and over until they were perfect. She'd make Lucy sweep the floor over and over until it was perfect. And I thought that was rather abusive, mm -hmm. psychologically abusive if nothing else. And I was writing about it. My computer died, just, you know, just went out completely. And I lost all my work for the night. And I was so upset about it. And I thought, okay, I can't do anything about it. And I went to bed. Well, remember that dream I talked about James Dean mm -hmm. last week? Well, Lucy came to me in a dream and she was mad. Well, I should say she was very stern. She, but she was like, look, Buster, I don't like what you wrote about my grandmother. I don't like that. I'm the one who made your computer crash. And then she... Wow. Yeah, yeah. And I remember those blue eyes right up to my eyes. And she was blazing because Lucy was a very forceful person. You know, she was a taskmaster. Uh, she said what she felt. And she was looking me in the eyes, blazing, saying, look, buddy, I don't like what you wrote. Now, you got to understand something. I loved my step grandmother and she loved me. And the fact that she made me do things over and over till they were perfect told me that she loved me and that established my own worth ethic because if you know anything about lucy she did that on i love lucy and all of her shows she made people do things over and over until they were perfect and then lucy said to me everybody said i was a bitch everybody said i was a monster because i was tough with people and i made people do things over and over and it was because i loved them and i cared about them just like my grandmother loved me. She taught me that's what love was. And the dream was so intense. I, <gasps> you know, those dreams where you wake up to your shaking, that, that's the kind of dream. It was like lightning going through me. And the next day I was walking through Pasadena thinking about that dream. And I realized that Lucy had just given me a big piece of the puzzle to understanding her. Because I had interviewed people, half the people were telling me what an angel she was and how wonderful and how loving. I had another half tell me, oh, she was a bitch. Oh, she was horrible. Oh, I, ooh, she was so tough and mean and awful. I realized that's what Lucy was telling me. She was misunderstood because she was just showing her love and care for people. And people thought she was being a bitch because she did it. But she was a perfectionist. You watch I Love Lucy. She wanted them to be their best, and she was willing to put time and effort into making sure. Yes, she was. Because you watch I Love Lucy, every person, right down to the person who has one line, is perfect. And that's because Lucy worked people until they were perfect. And she learned part of that, I believe, from her step-grandmother. So she gave me that tool. And now here's something that's interesting. I was in Pasadena, and I was still like, did I just imagine this? Did I just make this up? You know, I said, Lucy, if this was real, I want you to give me a sign. I swear this is true. I turned my head and in the store window is a great big I love Lucy pillow. <laughs> I my head right to that when I said, Lucy, give me a sign that that was you in the dream. I knew it was real. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we just saw your familiar uh, walking behind you, your cat, Sasha. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, this is Sasha. Beautiful. My son. Yes, yeah, Sasha is a beautiful kitten. Now, Thank you. Uh, there's a transition that starts to happen with you, the medium, and the artist, and Lucy, where it takes on a new dimension, uh, and she almost becomes like a spirit guide to you. Can you talk Very about much. She takes you up under her wing, and she starts to literally... She kind of does the same thing to you, doesn't she? She's the tax master that gets you up and... Yes, she does. She's the type of person, what are you doing sitting around on your butt? Come on, come on, get to work, get to work. You know, she'll, I hear that. I hear her nudging me if I'm getting a little lazy. Or the other extreme is sometimes she reminds me 
you know, you need to relax, you need to slow down. And that's the very nurturing motherly side of her, which I had other people tell me. She was like, this was a woman who was the head of a studio. And she would see a security guard in a booth at midnight when she was leaving in a car. She'd turn a car around, go back into a prop room and get a blanket and bring it back to the guard. She was very motherly like that. So I get a lot of that from her where she's tough with me, but she's also nurturing, very comforting. Um, I just, I just feel her around me a lot more so than any other spirit. And I don't want to make any audacious claims. This is just what my experience is. Hmm. I love her very much. Wow. So I want to talk now about the actual art you've done of Lucy a little bit of that. Yeah. When you are, I love that one. (laughs) I also love the one you did for me. I said, make me something romantic. And then you did a beautiful painting of of her with her husband. Oh, I love that one too. The my favorite her husband. You always felt that that was truly her soulmate, uh, Desi. Oh, yes. Yes. You know what's interesting? Um, his name was Desiderio. Oh, wow. Her name would, was Desiree. Both names translate to mean the same thing. Desire. Hmm. Yeah. They were, they were soulmates. They never got over each other. Uh, they remained very close friends. Desi once said in an interview that they spoke three times a week on the phone. And in fact, Lucy even took care of him for a while in her, her guest house when he was dying of cancer. Yeah, she never got over him. I've talked to many people who knew them who said that. You know, she, you know, she loved her husband, Gary, of course, but Desi was the great love. I think it was just a case of it was too intense too intense for both of them. It was a case of you can't live with someone, but you can't live without them either. Like after they both divorced, both of them became seriously ill. Lucy came close to dying from pneumonia. Desi almost died from uh, serious colitis. Wow. Yeah, they were both very sick. I think their physical bodies just could not handle the emotional impact of what had happened. Lucy even said we were never the same emotionally or physically after that divorce. Wow. That's yeah. very- In fact, do you know that Lucy was the last person Desi ever talked to? Uh, daughter Lucy Arnaz was taking care of him and she called her mother and said, uh, mom, I, I think you better talk to him. I don't, this doesn't look good. He hasn't eaten in three days. He's very weak. He can barely hold his head up. And she said, let me hold the phone to his ear. And Lucille said, "Uh, yes, of course, of course. And Lucy has told this story. Lucy Arnett has told this story because she could overhear. She just heard her mother going, Desi, I love you. 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 She kept saying it over and over, putting emphasis on each I love you. And then Desi. He was very weak, but he said, I love you too. And then he closed his eyes and went into a coma. Those were the last words he ever spoke. It was to Lucy. And the last thing he ever heard was Lucy's voice telling him she loved him. Oh, God, that's so I know. Isn't that incredible? Now, here's the kicker. Mm. It, the day turned out to be what would have been their 46th wedding anniversary. How beautiful. 46 wedding anniversary. You know, and it was just total coincidence. Oh, that's uh, so- conversation. That, no, that's soulmate love. Yeah. And also, Lucy Arnaz told the story. Uh, her mother came down three weeks earlier to visit Desi. And he was, of course, very frail. He was bald from chemotherapy. And he didn't want to be seen like that. And Lucille had to just kind of knock on the door. Please, hi, let me in. Let me in. He finally let her in. They sat on the edge of the bed and the daughter, daughter Lucy Arnaz, brought in a stack of VHS videotapes of I Love Lucy. And that's how they spent their very last afternoon watching I Love Lucy together, sitting on the edge of the bed. Oh, God. I know it's, I know I, I get emotional thinking about it too. Well, we all love them. Yeah. You know that Lucy... Uh, two or three months before she died, there was a Gallup poll taken 
um, naming we, people were to name who's the most beloved person in the world, the most beloved woman in the world. Mother Teresa was first. Princess Diana was second. Number three was Lucille Ball. Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Now I have a question. When, yes. oh, I love your baby. You're freezing a I little bit. Ho hopefully the film will be okay when we uh, download okay. it. All but right. when you're painting her, I know as a medium, yeah. that you are connecting, we call it re heart-centered remote viewing, that the actual yeah. technical term when you're bonding heart to heart with someone, whether they're alive or they've passed over, um, when you have that heart to heart connection with someone who's passed over, I know, of course, you can do it with Lucy, but you've also painted people that are unknown, pe friends and family. Oh, goodness. Can you talk about what it feels? I just need to know because I'm curious. As a medium, it just feels to me like you open your heart to the person who's passed over, yep. very similar to HCRV. And then do they lead you how to paint them? Do they tell you what they want? Like how does medium okay. work? I, I was going to say that? that no two situations are the same. So the stories are going to vary, but I can give you an example about, a year ago, I got this idea to do a series of portraits of 1930s starlets, women who came to Hollywood with talent and beauty, but never made it. They never made it to the league of Greta Garbo or Betty Davis or Hepburn. I thought that would be interesting to do a series of portraits of these, shall we say, forgotten women. And as I started doing those, I could feel their presence. I can't help this. Whenever I do a portrait, I may have, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I always focus on eyes first and foremost, because the eyes tell you everything you would ever want to know about a person. That's their soul. You see if their I soul. gave you a, my brother passed away when, when he was young. He died when yeah. he was 21. If I commissioned you to paint, uh, I mean, because I've been trying to connect with who, if I were to give you a picture yes. of my, my brother, I, would you be able to paint him and then maybe give a, a message? As to I do believe so, yes, because I almost invariably always do receive a message. I, you can't, because you see, I spend several hours on a portrait. I've never been too good at just doing quick sketches. I put a lot of detail into what I do, so a typical portrait can be anywhere from 5 to 15 hours. So that's a lot of time being in their energy, looking into their eyes. And I can't help it. Whenever I look at a photo, I can always see the story, the backstory of that person. I sense it, but invariably messages do start coming in, such as the starlets I was working on. I This may sound a little corny to say, but consistently, I would hear these women saying, oh, thank you for remembering me. Thank you for making me beautiful and young again. Thank you for bringing me back to life again. Like, I, I get that gratitude from them because these were women who were actresses. You know, if you know anything about actors, they're, yes. they're very showy people. They're very representational. They're very, look at me. So I got that sense that they were enjoying this process and they felt privileged by it. That's just what I got from them. But wow. messages are going to differ from each person. Um, I just recently did a portrait of um, a mother and her young child that was from a photo of 30 years ago the mother is now deceased and I could just hear her saying I want my son to know it's okay it's okay it's okay I, I'm in a good place right now it's okay I, I I love him I'm maybe that sounds very generalized but that's what I was hearing as I was doing the portrait and I was focusing on her eyes and her little boy um, I've done portraits of my mother that have been enormously healing because that's a chance to be in her energy again for a while, a chance to communicate and to release and to even forgive. And I also take joy in that. And I think she takes joy because my mother was a very beautiful woman in her youth. So I love, to, she, I love to do portraits. She looked like an actress. His mother was- She looked like Ava Gardner. Yes, yeah, she did. And so I love to do portraits of her when she was young, beautiful, because I can see she was happy. I really sense that was the one time in her life she was really, in, she was really happy. She was on top of her situation. She was optimistic. 
Because when I knew my mother, uh, oh, yeah. that optimism she, was long she was gone. Tear, she was going to tear up the town. I have a question for you. <laughs> yes. Is really true for you as a medium. And is that what I feel you do, like what you did for me when I went through my divorce and I was grieving and then you gave me oh. the Lucille ball and does that really meant a lot to me. And oh. when I was feeling broken down and I'm like, I'm old and I'm unloved. I mean, I really went oh. through a rough time, but I would look at that painting and see oh. their love and... It just really got me through it, through it a lot. But I, I just wanted to also say that I feel that in a way, spiritually, what you're doing in your paintings is you're healing the past for people that that person has passed on, that person's gone, and it's too late. A person may feel like it's too late for me to resolve yeah. my issue with this individual. And what I think you really have done, at least for me, just through your art, is you bring these people back to life and you bring their messages back. And in a way, you kind of heal the past and it helps us reframe the past. Can you speak to that at all? Well, uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I don't consciously sit out to do that always. Well, sometimes, but most of the part, I just sit out to do a really good portrait. But in doing a good piece of art, you have to get out of your head. You know, in your head, you have all of your technique, your schooling, your education, your background, what you've learned from making years of mistakes. But ultimately, you have to get out of your head and open your heart center up. That's the only way I know to work. And so when I open my heart center up, all this just naturally starts flowing through me. You're doing where. That's yeah, but I mean, you really are a heart-centered remote viewer. But you're yeah. what you're doing with your gift is your, your is the art, and that's the thing that yeah, I have no artistic talent. That's why I just love what you do. But I'm sorry to interrupt. Other gifts, so but <laughs> uh, but I was going to say that it's not like I consciously go, okay, I'm going to channel this and I'm going to encode this into the piece. No, it just naturally happens. Uh, the energy of that person goes into my work. It goes into the eyes. It goes into the expression. And I say this because other people have told me this. When they receive the art, they feel it. It's like, oh, my God, you brought that person back to life. That's, yeah, that's I, what I felt. That's I was just trying felt. to do my sincerest best. You know, I, I come from a place of no ego. If you know me, I'm very humble about my art. But I, I come from a place of love. And it just whatever comes out, comes out. It's like when I was doing the James Dean art for his hometown, and I told you I was feeling James Dean's energy. I said, right. Jimmy, I don't know what you want to say to the people in this art. I'm just going to be your vessel. Let it go into the art. Let it encode into the art. I'm just going to let it flow through me. Well, that's what happens when I'm doing portraits. It flows through me, and it comes on there. It's something bigger than me, much bigger than me. I'm just a vessel. I think about Mother Teresa, what she said about, I'm just a pencil in God's hands. Uh, I'm a pencil and a paintbrush. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a colored pencil. I'm just a vessel. All right. I have a couple questions from fans. Okay. Uh, you right. are getting a fan group. First off, they want to know <laughs> if you plan on having a YouTube channel because they want to support you. That's in the works. Uh, I've got to be honest. I am very feeble-minded when it comes to social media and technology and i'm at the mercy of a lot of good people who are helping me to do this so i'm trying to learn all the nuts and bolts of it finally mastered instagram finally have a website but i do need to do a youtube channel eventually that's gonna happen uh, so if people want you to do a spirit painting like say yeah. for a family member or something like that how, uh, how would they go about that well uh, they can contact me on my website, very easy, www.chuckdransfield.com. You know, I'm sure you're going to give the information also. All my contact info is on there. So mm -hmm. it's just as simple as firing me an email. And can you paint from a photograph? Say somebody has a picture of themselves with their husband and they don't Absolutely. feel that the relationship is resolved. You could look at the picture. Do oh, a yeah. painting and yes. In fact, that's my preferred method to working because I tend to work slowly, methodically. Sometimes it takes me several hours. So I am more comfortable with the photograph than a live model, though I've done that, of course. But I find with the photograph, everything I need is there. I can read the energy. And the, the photo is like a catalyst anyway, because once I start drawing and I'm focusing my energy, I've opened my heart, it comes in. It starts coming in. Now, it comes in different ways. 
Uh, sometimes it's just a very simple message. Like what I said about mothers just saying, I want to tell my son, I'm okay. Everything is fine. I love him. It's that simple. Occasionally it will be something a little more profound. Sometimes it's something intangible that I can't really put into words. It's more a feeling, but I try my best to put that feeling into the artwork. And I like to believe that the recipient of the art Maybe the same thing as me, where they're not going to get it in their conscious mind, but they're going to feel it. Mm-hmm. We'll feel that. We all know what that's like when we've gone to an art museum or we see a great movie, a play, a piece of literature where we feel it. Mm-hmm. We feel the energy. It's, it, it goes beyond the intangible, the tangible. It goes beyond that. And to me, that's always what genius is. You know, whether you're an actor, a writer, a musician, a dancer, it's those artists who go beyond the human realm they're tapping into something that you're channeling that you can't define and how, and you charge by the uh, the amount of time you put into the painting is that yes right? i do i do um i normally it it's going to depend on the medium i'm using i'm versed in a number of mediums but if it were something very detailed well like for example the lucy this is a technique of watercolor and colored pencil and it involves many, many layers of color. It's not unusual for me to put as many as 60 layers of color down. So a drawing like this would have about 15 hours in it. So something like this, it's very complex. I would have to maybe charge a little more. Uh, A drawing like that, I would say on average, about $350 on average, but I'm willing to work with a person. You know, if I, I see that that's out of their price range, I'll say, let's talk. Uh, Let's talk. What could you fairly give me? I would be receptive to hearing that. Maybe I could even work in something that would be a simpler style, like maybe something in pencil or charcoal or line drawing. So, but I'm, I try to be flexible with people because I, I, one of my great joys is making my art accessible to others. I, I love when people who normally can't have original art can have it because I've made it available to them. I, I do take joy in that. And, and I do see it as gratitude to the universe for giving me the gift. I think it's very important to give as much as we can where we can. Wow. This was so much much fun. I, you know, the next time you come, I want to, I mean, like you've, you have done so many paintings and uh, you've, you've channeled so many amazing people. Um, So you'll come back again, of course. Of course I will. And I just want to say thank you to everyone. The last interview, there were so many warm, loving responses you know, messages for me. You've been after me forever and ever to do an interview. I finally said, okay, let's do it. And I, it was like coming out of the closet with what I do. And I thought it was I get a lot of messages, you know, well, I don't want to say, you know, people's like, well, you're not, or you're, come on, you're making this up or whatever. No, everybody was very supportive. Well, I think you've proven it, it because you, you've, you've, you've checked your own stuff. You know, I think any kind of a heart center remote viewer or anybody who connects with spirit, we will check our work. We will go back and find out, is, did this happen? Or they'll give us a private little tidbit or something. And so oh, yeah. I think you've done that many times. All right, I have a couple more just in terms okay. of logistics. There have been a few people that want to buy the Lucy paintings. They want to buy the other paintings. Yeah. Had about 10, 12 people ask. I would say go to Chuck and have a spirit message you, you need uh, or just a loved one who's yes. passed over their art this is definitely the art that you've come this to is definitely life. something i can do for you the best and thank I you can- and I, many of the pieces are available as signed uh pieces signed and numbered limited edition pieces so just ask me you know it's a way if you can't afford a piece of original art i can make prints a lot more affordable i try to be accessible in every way but there are cases such as with lucille ball where there are legalities and i have to observe that that's why i say ask me about the individual piece cool. I can make- well thank you chuck and uh, again if anybody wants to find out more about chuck's amazing uh career and art you can go to chuckdransfield.com
www.thebrightsidesoftheheart.com. All right. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thank you. I love you. Love you too, hon. We'll see you next time. Peace out. Okay. See you next time. Goodbye.